Great. Uh, 11.05 Pacific time, Tuesday, June 25th, and welcome to the CNCFCI working group call. On the agenda today, we'll take a look at some in progress and upcoming events on our radar. We will take a look at some updates to the cncf.ci status dashboard, as well as some work in progress, some tickets in progress, and uh, possibly discuss moving this call to one hour later from 11 a.m. Pacific time to 12 noon Pacific time. If you are on the CNCF Slack channel, please join the cncf-ci channel to continue the conversation after this call. You're also welcome to join the public mailing list, the CNCF-ci public mailing list, also listed in the meeting notes. Are there any other items um, folks would like to add to the agenda before we get started? Is my audio okay? Yeah. Great. Well, no worries. If anything comes to mind, please feel free to um, add to the meeting notes and agenda or in the Zoom chat or just verbalize if you have anything you'd like to add, including upcoming events. So as we speak, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, Open Source Summit, China 2019 is happening in Shanghai. Thanks for all attending. If you are in Shanghai, it is two in the morning there. So I appreciate your, your time and attention for the CI Working Group call. Uh, earlier today, there was an intro and deep dive, birds of a feather for the telecom user group and the Cloud Native Network Functions CNF test bed. And I believe, Taylor, you're on the call. How did your uh, session go today. It was great. We had a lot of participation from both uh, telecom providers as well as vendors and um, some interest from, I would say, more like uh, Kubernetes developers and stuff. There were a few people there uh, that are interested in, I guess, the CI side of things in general, besides all of the networking aspects. So it was a good session, good conference so far. Sounds good. Well, congratulations on a good session and hope you enjoy the rest of your time there for the duration of the conference. Also happening now is Container Days 2019 is anyone on the call currently attending that conference? All right, well, I hope it's going well. Coming soon in the end of September is the Open Networking Summit in Europe. It is in Antwerp, Belgium, just a train ride from Brussels. The CFP has closed, so those who have submitted CFPs to ONS will receive your notifications on Friday, July 5th, with the schedule announcement on July 10th. At the end of October is Open Source Summit Europe in France, and it looks like the CFP window is still open. You have until Monday, July 1st to get your CFP in for OSS Europe. In November will be the next KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in North America and San Diego. The CFP window is open until July 12th. And there are, are several co-located events. One uh, with the CFP window open that I'm aware of is EnvoyCon and the CFP window closes on July 12th for that co-located event as well. Are there any other uh, conferences 
or co-located events at KubeCon that anyone would like to mention. Sounds good. I'm sure more will uh, be released and publicized as the time gets closer. So I'll share a little bit about what the team has been working on on the CNCF CI status dashboard since our last call in April. The meeting notes and the slide deck are shared to anyone with the link. If you're interested in following along, uh, the link is in the CI working group document. This call will be recorded and published to the CNCF YouTube channel. So CNCF.CI v24 Oh, and v241 releases. We released v240 on May 14th, where we added ARM support to three of the CNCF hosted graduated status projects, CordianS, Prometheus, and FluentD. And we also updated the test environment dropdown to include a label checkmark, a light gray hover, and we adjusted the height of the footer. I'll go to cncf.ci production now and show you those changes. So the test environment here at the top of the page is your Kubernetes test environment. You can select if you would like to look at the stable Kubernetes or the head commit of Kubernetes on x86 or ARM. And so when I select Kubernetes stable on ARM, the provisioning was a success to bare metal packet and the build and deploy stages for Core DNS, Envoy, FluentD, and Prometheus are active. We've not yet added ARM support to Linkerd or ONAP at this time. Likewise, if I go to the head commit, I can see the status of the builds and deploys for those projects that support ARM. received a fun, fun bit of press on adding ARM to CNCF CI, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation arms itself with graduated project support. So that was fun. In 241, we added ARM support to Envoy. And we also updated the hardware provisioning code to use the reserved ARM machines. Thank you so much, Packet, for providing reserved machines for both x86 and ARM. This really helps with the, I guess, percentage of times we see success. Sometimes it would be failed because in that moment in time, at 3 a.m. Eastern time, when we were provisioning these machines, maybe another um, customer was also provisioning machines, and so there wasn't one available for the CNCF-CI. Now the machines are reserved just for CNCF-CI, and we see the successful provisioning much more often now. So thank you very much. Hey, Lucina, it's uh, Philip here. I see that for the Envoy build on ARM, there was a failure. Is, it, is, is the base or dependency or issue fixed now, or is that still, uh, is that still a problem? Hi, Philippe. Let's take a look. It looks like it is still mentioning Basil. Uh, Denver or Taylor, would you like to speak to this issue? Yeah, this is only happening on the stable release for um, Envoy at the moment, for some reason with ARM. But the same build works on head. So right. I haven't had a chance to dive into that, but I'm suspecting maybe that the stable release is mixing some patches. OK, no worries. I was just um, checking. This is this is Ed Vilmetti from Packet. I am aware that um, the 
Basil um, build system for ARM has gone through some iterations and uh, at various points it has not been completely stable. So I might, I might also look to that as a possible source of uh, opportunities to engage in the community there. Okay, thanks. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, since our last call in April, we also had uh, some presentations at KubeCon Europe. There's an intro to CNCFCI, and the information is here in the slides. You can take a look at, um, if you go to the sketch, you can find the slides as well as the YouTube recording for both the intro and the deep dive. And the deep dive topic was adding ARM to CNCFCI and really digging into the code and talking about um, some of the challenges and benefits and how uh, lessons learned and our experience adding ARM to those four graduated projects. Currently, we are working on our 3.0 release. Uh, that will include, we're adding subheaders to display the CNCF hosted projects by CNCF maturity level. This is ticket 120 in the cross cloud repo. And we will be, as we're adding more projects to the dashboard, we'll be showing all of the graduated projects together right under the test environment. And then we'll show the incubating CNCF projects followed by currently the Linux foundation project of ONAP. Once we get the graduated and incubating projects added, then there's definitely room for adding, starting to add sandbox projects. First though, we'll focus on the, the graduated level and incubating level. So that's in progress now. Uh, I'll ask the team, uh, does anyone on the team want to show the current status of this ticket, adding subheaders on the call? Hey guys, this is Josh. Um, I believe I could show a current status. Let me, give me one second. Um, still a work in progress, we're nearly there, but let me share my screen. Pull it up here, okay. Okay, I believe this is it. And so um, we've got a, um, essentially we're, um, we have the three uh, CNCF relation stages right now to start with graduated projects, incubating projects and Linux Foundation projects. Um, they're all pulling through, organized um, through a YAML file with um, the, um, labeled project uh, CNCF relation uh, subheader sections, as well as um, ordering. And so it's coming along, it's nearly ready to be released. That looks great. And yes, uh, the, our mock is a little bit um, out of date. So our mock had, I believe, Linkerd in or no, it had fluency in the incubating, but it had since graduated. So thank you so much for updating that. No problem. Looking forward to seeing it on production. Coming soon. I'll jump back onto the screen share. The next item that's in progress is a, our epic of refactoring the CI system. The goals to refactoring the CI system are twofold. We want to um, deprecate the cross-cloud Kubernetes provisioner that was custom made and we want to use a community tool um, kubeadm and we also want to make it easier for CNCF hosted projects to contribute to the CNCF CI dashboard 
by adding and maintaining their projects directly. And the current setup makes it, uh, the current setup is not optimized for external contributions. So that's one of our main goals uh, for doing the CI refactoring. And so far, we've broken it down to several parts for the main epic of supporting KubeADM for bootstrapping the Kubernetes clusters on packet. And so far we have um, made good progress on updating how hardware is provisioning. So Denver, if you'd like to talk a little bit about it, I've dropped in our visual representation of the CI infrastructure refactor as well. And if you'd like to share your screen for anything or want me to go to any link, please let me know. Um, here should be all right. I don't, I won't be able to share my screen, but I can just talk to it. So we've finished the first component of this, which was separating out the hardware provisioning versus the, the Kubernetes bootstrapping because in the past with cross cloud, they were one of the same, but as a CI system, we want to have both those parts be composable. So if the provisioning fails, we know that that failed and have better Terraform logging so we can tell why it failed and then be able to run retries and roll back. So it's not just a, a fail and the job's over. And that involved adding some additional scripts to be able to, to check inventory at packet when we're not using reserve servers. So do we have, we're asking for five nodes, are there, is there capacity for that? So we've added things like that, which will allow us to go, okay, check the facility, do we have everything that we need? And if it's not there, switch to another one. And so the hardware provisioning stage is now complete. And the next portion that we're working on is getting cube space um, ready to support the CNCF CI project. So the large amount of the, most of the work we're doing on that at the moment is adding ARM support. Cube spray already supports ARM at this point, but we need it to support our builds so we we know what version of Kubernetes we're versioning at running. And if we're doing a head deploy of Kubernetes, we need to know what commit so we can show it in the dashboard. So that's in progress. And then the next ticket we have after that also is to support Containerd because Containerd is a project under CNCF, but at the moment, um, KubeSpray is only supporting DockerD directly. And that covers everything in progress on that side of things. Lucina? Can I ask a question, um, maybe if, since we have some packet folks on regarding the provisioning stage? Um, I dropped a link to a, a question I had on the packet uh, Slack. Um, I don't know, Ed, if, if you saw that thread, this is on the integration thread. So anybody that has, if you've already joined the packet Slack can go to that, it's an, an integration channel. Um, but I, I can speak to it real fast. So when Denver was working on the capacity checks, there's a API, um, which actually I can drop that. So there's a API call um, in the packet API that lets you do capacity checks for non-reserves, so the on-demand instances and it's, it doesn't say that, that it's on demand, but that's what it actually is. There isn't, doesn't seem to be the capability to check reserved. So what we ended up having to do is um, go through multiple um, different API calls to do the equivalent of the capacity check. And you have to do it in a loop for all the types of machines that you're doing as well as all the facilities um, to figure out capacity which means when provisioning is happening specifically for the um, the environments that use reserved instances on cncfci it's going to have to do a lot of calls and 
that's without like increasing the number of how often um, instances are provisioned. Like if, if it was more often than the current once a day, which could happen as well as as more projects are added. So if all of the incubating projects are added, then it's going to be related. Or if, if we add more, I should say more options and spinning up more clusters and other stuff like that uh, when you're provisioning. So I, I don't know, Ed, if you saw that and if you could speak to yeah. it. Or... Yeah, I did see it. And I guess I had, I, I had some questions to, Try to clarify what you're looking for. Um, there's uh, just to let you know, Ed um, yeah. Mo at Mo over at Packet. He he said he created something internal in Jira. Okay. To track, but I that's all I know. Um, that was okay. the last thing. But yeah, just just to make sure that I have you? your intent correctly. Mm -hmm. So your you're trying to figure out with a simple call how many or to basically to characterize which of the multiple reserve nodes you currently um, can provision. Are you trying to figure out, you're trying to figure out if there's any reserved facilities and plans in other words machines that you already have set aside you're trying to figure out whether they're in use or not or whether they're free essentially can can using reserved instances can packet fulfill my request of three nodes of m to extra larges and oh okay so specifically specifically validate yeah okay i, I see what's yeah the I was trying to distinguish between the case of uh, uh, facility out of inventory versus um, reserved inventory already in use. And I think- Yeah, so we, we're looking at a, in a, a facility base by base. So I first try SJC. Do we have the reserve capacity to to provision this, these amount of resources. And the trick with the, um, the reserved ones is the deprovision time is quite a lot. So we may deprovision, but then try run again, but it's still 15 minutes until they're available again. So. Right. And there's not a lot of visibility into the deprovisioned, but still reserved nodes. Those are hard to find. Right. Okay, I understand now. It's the it's the deprovision cycle you're trying to get that you don't currently have very much visibility into, and therefore you can't guarantee that a provision against reserve nodes will work because the nodes might be in a in a, a deprovision state. Right. Okay. It makes more sense. I'll talk to Mo about this, find the JIRA, um, add any explanation to it based on this context and, and uh, try to bring it forward. Yeah, I'd, ideally it would work at the higher level, just like the, the other capacity check. And um, if, if you don't specify specific uh, instance IDs, uh, whenever you're using the reserve, then the machine creation API acts pretty similar. So it would do next available from the pool of reserved, similar to next available from the pool of on-demand. Ideally, the capacity check from a high level would do the same. Do you have enough capacity in your reserve pool? Yes, go forward. And if not, that's you know we can get more specific but ideally you can at least do the minimum of that i don't know if there's if you can provide information on those are deprovisioning that's would be great but that's that's probably um would be the 
next level of details. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that provides some context. I I hadn't been thinking about the deprovisioning step, but obviously that can take a machine out of your usable pool for uh, a meaningful amount of time. Yeah, and if, if you're not digging through the right API calls, then it's kind of invisible what why it's happening. It's just missing. They're there. Just missing. Yeah, they're, it's, you'd have to go through a lot of other, when you look at the hardware reservation call, there's a lot of um, references to other APIs that you have to call through to start mm. gathering all the information before you have an idea of what's happening. So, right, and there are a couple of there are a couple of states that might be um, invisible to distinguish between, um, you know, reprovisioning, uh, deprovisioning in process, versus what occasionally happens is deprovisioning fails. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how you would tell that a reserve node had had failed to deprovision correctly. So yeah, that's that's worth looking at and and clarifying and and uh trying to make a API endpoint that's straightforward to use. At a minimum, if there's gonna be deprovisioning or that we could say what is the state of the system? And if we know it's in a deprovisioning state and there's some type of timestamp related, then Ideally, we can at least derive that, oh, it shouldn't be in the deprovisioning state for two hours. <laughs> right. And, and that would at least tell us that even if, if there's something broken within the packet side that it failed and it can't, you know, it's not updating, but at least for, as a human, we could derive something from that. Right. Okay, I'll sync up with Mo and make sure that that uh, ticket is is advanced. Okay. Um, this is uh, Watson. I had a comment too. If we're talking about um, checking capacity, I guess uh, Denver mentioned this, what I would call it an atomic way. So saying are three servers available because I need three, otherwise it's not useful to me. I guess I didn't, don't remember the API says, can you reserve three at a time? But that also, you're still gonna run into problems if you can't also reserve in an atomic way, sets of three or whatever. So that's a good to topic. About. That was uh, Watson, I'd, I'd forgotten all about that. And that's that's relevant to the on-demand as well. Um, yeah. Atomically creating a set of servers that we need. And this is something when we were going through talking about the refactor, what would happen if if we're provisioning the, the cluster and you go through and you've gotten to a point where one of the nodes is not available or not at that time, because there is there is a time period from a capacity check to creating each one, of, each one of the machine nodes. And we could hit it, especially if the cluster size is larger, where some right, of the it's a, no longer available. It's a race condition. You, yeah. you you check the capacity, but by the time you actually go to provision, the state has changed. Yeah, so it's almost like it's not a capacity check. It would be this is a, a actual request to allocate those machines as an entire set. And then you, when you say allocate them all, whatever you do for implementation on the backside, you, you mark those where they're going to be provisioned even if uh, or they're available to whoever asked right okay makes sense mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that given given your description of, of it i'm sure that um you're not the only person who has seen this behavior so for us right now we treat it as an atomic action on um, the CNCF provisioning side and we just say the cluster is unusable and we'd need to start the entire machine provisioning again. That, that will be the approach we'll go down until there's something in the API that can help that. 
Right. Because two machines is useless if you need three. Yep. And of course, we're, we're doing, these are rather small cluster sets. Um, you know, someone else may say we need 50 for you know, right. whatever they're doing. Okay, good to know. Thanks for the feedback. Thanks. That's great, thank you. And we're also working on the EPIC to add support for external contributions. And currently we've um, completed one step, which is changing where the project details, the display name, logo, and caption are retrieved for the dashboard. And in progress, we are working on the release details. And so that corresponds to the visual columns you can see on CNCFCI. So anything under the project column has a new repo per project where those details can be updated. And currently we're working on things within the release column. And I'll take a look at the link that was dropped in the meeting notes. And Watson, would you like to talk a bit about changing the release details? <clears throat> yeah, so the release details, what we're trying to do is have it so that the, the project owners, maintainers can have more control, um, fine grain control um, when they add the project. So release details are, are there in the YAML file on the bottom. This file is something that the project maintainers would uh, eventually um, control. So stable ref is, uh, and, and I give a little bit of history of the stable ref and what a ref is. A ref is really a semantic version, or we hope a semantic version, that's really anything that a product maintainer decides as a tag for their release name. Um, we, you know, uh, talked previously about trying to do this programmatically on our end or something, and it just doesn't work. Some people don't use semantic versioning. Some people do different things. Um, so we, it's best for us, we had to maintain that in a string. And so we want, we'd rather have it to where the uh, project maintainers do that. And then of course the, the um, head ref is a branch name. So you've got a, um, a tag or a branch is both of those, either of those can be in GitLab parlance is a ref. Um, so, um, we allow for the project contributors now to um, they can do a pull request against their um, respective uh, project dash configuration file that's under the cross cloud project on the cncfci.yaml. And in the future, we're going to have it to where that cncfci YAML is actually in the, um, the project's uh, repo so that they can maintain it kind of like a Travis CI or Circle CI style. And so that's the direction we're going. And that's on dev now. So we're looking to have that up and on prod sometime this week. Thanks, Watson. And yes, we'll also update the contributing guide. We've got under cross cloud CI repo, the contributing markdown file, which will be updated incrementally as each one of these steps are updated. So currently you can update the release details and follow the steps here. And once we have the stable ref and the head ref um, promoted through, we'll update this contributing guide to add those steps as well. After release details, we will be working on the integrations with the external systems to retrieve the build details from the CNCF project CI system. So we currently do an external integration with one of the projects that are on the dashboard and that is ONAP and ONAP uses Jenkins. So we're connected to that external CI system. And we'll take a look at the graduated projects first and see if they're using Travis CI or Circle CI or drone.io and decide and and pick one integration to start with.
After that, we'll work on the app deploy phase. So we'll use the container artifacts that were published by the CNCF project to inform the deploy step and update the documentation. And then we'll be able to um, start collaborating with the CNCF hosted projects to, for um, more um, interaction and having them add and maintain their projects. And after that, we'll work on the end-to-end -end tests with the projects. There is one project that is currently on the dashboard that is in need of an update. So we're continuing a conversation with the Linkerd team to update the Linkerd project from Linkerd 1 to Linkerd 2. Currently, the dashboard is synced up with their Linkerd 1.x project, and we'll be updating that to point to the Linkerd 2 repo. So that's in planning now. Could I um, speak to the external integration side? Yes, please. Thanks, Taylor. Um, Philippe, I don't know if, if you're familiar with, um, how familiar you are with the work that Matt Spencer uh, is doing on the drone side with FluentD, but maybe you'd be able to talk to that as well. Um, I had a pretty extensive conversation in KubeCon Shanghai uh, yesterday with Matt Spencer from ARM and he was talking about uh, builds for FluentD um, on the Travis CI and issues that we've been seeing specifically with the ARM builds and so we got into some different conversations about um, the different CI systems that can run and I know there's a lot of other um, CI systems that are used, being used in general, but also um, some of the problems that people have had on, on some of the existing ones and they're looking at moving to maybe GitLab or uh, if they have really extensive needs or if they're needing something more portable. So Drone IO was one of the um, ones that looks promising for people who want multiple architectures and something that's real portable and we were discussing how um, number one we could help the projects directly by saying here's a easier way to run or do builds on different architectures maybe for every pull request was something that Matt was saying ARM is focused on and then we're interested in being able to support those external systems. So ideally we can have some collaboration with, with ARM where if there's um, a drone, potentially if there's like a drone um, CI running for the ARM builds for a project like FluentD, then if we can have the status um, for those builds available, Specifically, right now, that would mean anything on head or the master branch, um, as well as releases. And then the next piece would be the thing that we've seen it mentioned, which is artifacts. So if, if there's a new release of FluentD and it builds and works as expected on ARM, then ideally we could figure out where the artifacts, which by, by that I mean um, Ideally, that would be container, uh, container or containers that are published on something like Docker Hub or wherever remote. I think it's promising for the effort that we've been working on because we do want external folks that are actually creating some of those CIs. Right now, we've been doing most of the work like the ONAP integration to Jenkins. We did get some input on the status, but if there's someone actually building it for a project, that would be great. But uh, Philippe, did you have any input around this particular effort with ARM? No, I think you've captured it all. Uh, 
Um, mostly, I think uh, Matt has been working more actively at testing that and drawing seems quite promising. We are, we are engaging more actively with some of the other CI systems or companies behind it, but uh, drone that currently seem to be quite well set up to actually get this, uh, get this uh, running. So that's, um, that's the reason why Matt actually uh, discussed the way he did with you on that. Okay. Um. And I guess a, a related item was there was, I know there was some maybe a need for help on Git ARM builds on GitLab. So ARM builds of projects using GitLab. And we've approached it in multiple ways, including using VMs uh, for the ARM to build uh, the projects for ARM as well as using uh, the physical packet machines and deploying um, runners and and actually building the the various projects the um, their ARM side on packet machines and I guess I would like to if if there's problems that people are having with GitLab um, for ARM builds then Priyanka, maybe that's something that you can get engaged with and, and try to help drive and make sure yes. that that's well supported. Um, I, I'm not quite sure yeah. what the actual issues, uh, Philippe, that Matt just said that they were having some problems and uh, drone IO seemed to be working uh, pretty easily for the use cases that FluentD was doing. So I, I'm, and if, uh, just to go back, FluentD is on Travis, they're not on GitLab, but they were looking at GitLab and so having some I, problems. Can I can I speak to that real quick? Yeah. Um, they did have their pipelines moved to GitLab, um, and uh, so the right, especially their Linux ones, which can use the GitLab shared runners on .com. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they do have some workloads on GitLab in addition to Travis and sounds like Drone as well. Well, do you know, um, so do you know anything about the ARM specific stuff on GitLab or is there a ticket or something that folks okay. can? Yeah, I can, let me check that. Let me search for the right ticket for you, issue for you guys and post paste it here. And it's, it's possible that um, we can help since we did, we do have ARM builds working for, uh, as we've shown all the projects and it may be that the the way that we're going about it is not what other folks would be using. Got it. So let me uh, kickstart an email between Taylor, yourself, me, Eduardo, and someone from the GitLab CI product site, and then okay. people. Um, and Philip, who would be good to get on that from um, your side? I think Matt is the best person to uh, get on board for from our side about that. Matt and Eduardo, Eduardo is already connected on the, on the free and side, but Matt is more specifically tracking that. I think. So is is that um, Matt.Spencer at ARM or how, how is That's that? right, Matt.Spencer Matt at ARM.com. Yeah. Okay. This is Ed. I am aware of a set of patches that were put together um, to support GitLab Runner on ARM. Um, and that got pulled into a broader discussion of uh, GitLab Runner on multiple architectures. And I will, I, I know that there are some, there are some open issues that uh, might be worth um, reviewing uh, for that. Um, which I'll, which I'll identify. And I'd love to help as much as I can, just getting people to, to respond from our end and all of that. Thanks, yeah, I think, Bianca, thanks as, I, as I understood the discussion last, some things were gated behind uh, some Windows runner development. Um, essentially, there was a code path that uh, 
required one task to be complete before the next task started, um, uh, specific to Windows. So I think if I had to characterize things, no one has said no to this request yet, uh, but it's been uh, uh, a challenge to get to yes. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, if you have the issue, if you can, uh, if you can put it, that would be great. Otherwise, I can lower search too. Okay, I'll take something up. Thank you. So um, we do have runners on ARM, so I definitely want to get um, Denver and our side involved. So if you can put, um, just get us all on that list, and we can at least contribute the knowledge about how we're doing it, which may may not be the best way, but at least it can show here is a working example. Thanks, everyone. All right, great. So we welcome feedback. Uh, we've got the CrossCloud CI, CI dashboard, GitHub tracker. Um, you're welcome to join Slack, CNCF Slack at cncf-ci. Email, join the mailing list. And this call is at the fourth Tuesday of the month at currently 11 a.m. Pacific time. The next item on the agenda was maybe having a lazy consensus of plus ones, thumbs ups. Uh, if folks on this call would be available to move this, if we move this call to one hour later, starting at 12 noon Pacific time. I'm good with that. Looks like Taylor is as well. Oh, Christian in Denver as well. Philippe as well. Ed as well. All right. Wonderful. I think that's a quorum. <laughs> Uh, can I uh, request to uh, resurface one of the uh, things that was discussed before I could join this call, KubeCon uh, uh, San Diego, if possible? Um, yes, of course. Uh, the CFPs are open until July 12th for KubeCon North America. Yes, and I was just wondering if anyone here is interested in collaborating on some uh, proposals. I really want to submit some talks around CI, uh, CICD, and just uh, not not like a GitLab CI story, but more like I think this group here has a lot of the uh, <laughs> CI brain trust, <laughs> and we could put together something that is educational for a lot of folks. Maybe even just the CNCF CI working groups were experience working with many projects and what we can distill for other folks. I, I don't know. There are just so many ideas, but if anyone's interested, I, I can um, kick off a work stream to come up with a nice proposal for us to go submit. And no worries I, if not. <laughs> I think it sounds like a good idea. Um, why don't uh, maybe ping off offline? Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. I'll definitely do that. And just FYI, I'm keynoting at the Open Source Summit in Lyon, France, and would be delighted to talk about the work here over there as well. Great. Yeah, I think I'd be interested in doing it. Awesome. Cool. Um, let me open the talk. Where's the talk? <laughs> I've been following it on the um, Zoom, so I don't have it open. Um, whoever's writing notes, would you mind writing Denver and Taylor's names? Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Just right there. There you are in there. And I'll reach out to both of you. Cool. Thank you so much. That sounds great. All right, so we will see you again on the fourth Tuesday of July. Continue the conversation on Slack and the mailing list. And I will ask the CNCF CI team to update the community calendar for this call to start at 12 noon Pacific time for next time. These meeting notes are available anytime. So if, if you have any demo or news or updates or questions that you would like to address in next month's call, please feel free to add them at any time. I'll do my best to send reminders to the mailing list, Slack, and our Twitter page. Um, so we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everyone for your time. It was nice chatting with you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.